Good evening, and welcome to episode 17 of the Hope for Healing video podcast. I'm Dr. John Strax. I'm joining you from my office here in Chicago, and I'm here this evening with Marianne Froelich, who is also with me in Chicago. For those of you who are new to the video cast, Hope for Healing is a joint effort between the people at the Curable app and me. I'm a physician in the Chicago area who focuses on the reduction and elimination of physical symptoms using mind-body medicine methods, and Curable is an amazing app that has the same goal. We've been working together since their inception about six years ago. This evening, Mary and I will discuss her story of healing for about 45 minutes and then take some questions. If you do have questions, you can type it into the question and answer feed if you're with us here on Zoom or into the chat on the Facebook feed. Both of those feeds will get to us. We'll do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. Also, I want you to know that I have expanded my telehealth practice significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've been able to sustain that now that the pandemic is starting to wind down. So no matter where you are, if you're feeling stuck with your symptoms, feel free to reach out to my staff through our website, www.drstrax.com, and my staff will get into touch, in touch with you about how to set up a consultation. Finally, my framework for talking about this is commonly referred to as mind-body medicine, meaning that our body can express for us what's going on in our minds or in our lives. That's universal, doesn't make us bad, doesn't make us sick, it only makes us human. And it only becomes bad if you enter into a medical system that doesn't understand the concept and assumes that all symptoms are physical in origin. Human beings have always expressed symptoms, expressed their lives through their bodies, and we always will. Our goal, Curable's goal, is to help you understand that and to teach you what to do about it so that it's no longer physically uncomfortable or painful for you. So with that, let me introduce Marion. Marion is the head of design and advertising agency here in Chicago. She spent the last two decades devoting herself to virtual storytelling and creative craftsmanship. In 2015, Marion reached a tipping point with her chronic pain symptoms that threatened her livelihood as well as her emotional and physical health. With mind-body medicine healing, she began to identify pain as a physical reaction to her emotions was able to overcome symptoms such as severe IBS, anxiety, depression, carpal tunnel syndrome, numbness, body pain, and more. Marion, you say that you live a richer and a fuller life at this point than you ever thought was possible. So I am delighted to have you here tonight to join me on Hope for Healing. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It feels like a privilege to be able to share my story. I'm so glad. Um, so anyways, in preparation for tonight, I went back in my records and found out that you and I met each other 10 years ago this week when I was at, I was new at Northwestern Hospital. And you came in to talk to me about a number of symptoms, but I don't think we talked at all about mind-body medicine at that point. Is that your recollection as well? Absolutely. I, I think I came in because um, I was just at that turning point in life where, um, and I was getting really curious about nutrition and eating habits and, and wanting um, more integrated methods of care and healing. And um, I had a really nice list of complaints at that time, you know, allergies and stomach problems and IBS. And um, I had been sort of coerced by friends to start looking into that as an avenue for healing versus, you know, traditional methods. Mm -hmm. yep. And so what do you remember? What do you remember about that first meeting that you and I had? My records say, like I said, we didn't talk about mind body medicine at all. I think you remember oh, yeah. I had it at least in my head, but what's, what's your recollection of what we talked about that? Um, I just remember uh, feeling super uncomfortable in your office uh, because I felt like you asked me a lot of questions that I was not used to being asked by a doctor. Usually you go into a doctor, you say, I have these health complaints and boop, 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 all of a sudden a list of solutions comes out. And I remember you being more inquisitive. And one of the things that I remember was like, not feeling like I could meet you eye to eye. And that was mostly just because, yeah, it was just also new and fresh to me, you know? Um, and yeah, I just, I was, I just frankly like a little freaked out. 
And you came back, you came back to me a couple of months later. We talked about a lot of different things that didn't have to do with mind body medicine, what you're eating, what supplements to use. I had you see one of our nutritionists yep. in our office. And then you, you came back, we checked in. And then I think you came back a few years later. And was that when I came back because of mind body medicine? I think so. It may have been even like, there may have been an interim in there, but at some point you came back. Yeah. So I came back. Uh, I do think I came back a few years later and was definitely just trying to re up my like sort of health game just in general. And, and then, um, and then the journey sort of began. So like, I, I think at the time that I first met you, I had things like IBS and allergies and probably some anxiety disorder and a little bit of depression that I wasn't really, you know, super aware of yet. Um, but was looking for like food and what I put into my body to be the answer. That's what I remember about that time of my life. That was like where I was going with it. And I was definitely um, feeling better because I was doing this form of like empowered self-care through nutrition, right? And then, then this sort of brings me into what the next, I guess, level of healing was, which um, around 2012, I just started to get body pain in a way that I never had before. I had completed um, marathon training for two years. I actually completed the marathon um, in 2011 and, uh, you know, had some injuries uh, post-marathon that um, was probably the first time in my life I ever started to doubt my physical body. Um, I had always just, you know, never really had a connection with my body. Um, but I really, you know, put the effort into do the marathon and then, you know, I had some, some stuff happen afterwards where, um, I was on crutches because I had some fractures in my pelvis and stuff. And I just remember, um, words like osteopenia and low bone density and all this kind of stuff were revealed to me by a sports medicine doctor. And it started to kind of making me feel weird. I was like, oh, I'm 30s. I'm in my thirties. And like, things are starting to fall apart. And that's a little bit of a mental narrative I've always had in the background. Um, I had two parents who uh, had a lot of health issues growing up. And so I had a lot of tr- emotional triggering around not wanting to be like them by wanting to be like penultimate physical health. Right. Um, so anyway, in 2012, I started to have things happen like my neck, you know, couldn't turn it all the way. Ouch. You know, and it, it was random at first and then it became repeated. Right. So then the neck like just chronically was not working. Um, you know, I'm a graphic designer and an artist. So spending a lot of time using my hands, my left hand to draw and my right hand to mouse. And what really sunk in for me besides, you know, my feet hurting or my leg hurting, or I went on a run and I've got like this crazy stitch on my side that just keeps happening over and over again. It was my hand going numb that really set the wheels in motion, not only for the pain, but also the like insane amount of information gathering to try to heal it, right? And uh, what happened was I was using my hand and I noticed that the fingers were starting to go numb. And I was feeling all this tension in my shoulder and my neck. And, you know, when I went on the almighty internet, what it was telling me was I had something called a repetitive strain injury, which is very common for people who sit at their desk working all day. So I'm taking that information in and I'm seeing and feeling that this hand is literally losing its, um, its efficacy. It's just not working. Like my, I couldn't, my writing was changing. I, the grip was getting softer in my hand. Um, and when I did go see a medical professional about it, they said I had, um, thoracic outlet syndrome. Which is funny. Like I've, I've, I've told my story on various podcasts, including the Caribou podcast. And that's what I di- self-diagnosed myself with in 1998, I guess, when I was first learning about it. So it's a common one. Like I've never actually seen somebody who has thoracic outlet syndrome, but it's a common diagnosis that's given when these kinds right. of Right. And they say it's this impingement of nerves, like sort of here in this collarbone area that starts to affect all the way down to your arm. So I became a believer that I had a repetitive strain injury from my vocation over the 20 years or whatever, that time, 15 years that I had been doing it. And that's what that was. Check, right? 
So physical therapy, all that kind of stuff started to happen in order to treat the issue. Did it get better? No. What happened was, is things started to compound. Then there became other types of physical problems, right? Just in general, my back was just in pain. It was just the neck, the shoulders, the back, the lower back. Um, and I sort of just started to mentally devolve into, this is what happens. I'm in my middle thirties. Middle Your body starts to break down. I have this job, repetitive strain injuries. Guess what popped up? Carpal tunnel syndrome. So then I am diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome on both sides. What's interesting, fun fact, is that my mom was also diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome when she was in her 40s and she had the surgery on both hands and it didn't do much for her. It just, it didn't really fix anything. It was just an intervention and she did it because that's what you did back in the 80s when you, you were diagnosed with stuff like that. So then I'm diagnosed with carpal tunnel. Um, I don't know, like, it's kind of like, uh, blurry to me what other exacting physical things there were, but I can tell you that um, lethargy and probably some level of chronic fatigue syndrome was haunting me at that time. And as we have discussed even today, you know, I think it still comes back for me. Um, but these things compounded. I was definitely seeking, you know, traditional medicine to tell me at pivotal moments what, what are these things that are wrong with me. IBS, carpal tunnel. At one point I met with a rheumatologist because the amount of pain I was starting to feel across the entire body, zinging and zapping me from upper body to abdomen, to legs and feet, they were starting to say, this could be fibromyalgia. We're going to track it. That's how people get diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Yeah. They and that it. was yeah. just like a bugging death sentence to me. And I was like, this all makes sense. My mother has rheumatoid arthritis. My father had like a colon issue where he had a piece of his colon removed. He had um, ulcerative colitis, right? Ulcerative colitis. So I'm starting to triangulate my own health issues, IBS and the, the hands and the carpal tunnel. And my mom had rheumatoid arthritis and look at me, I'm at a rheumatologist and I'm being told I have fibromyalgia, which is even worse, maybe you know, and I'm going to be in a wheelchair. And, you know, at the time I was so filled with fear that the confirmation of these pains actually being real and having names and labels attached to them was, was one part, I guess, um, helpful because I needed a name at the same time, it was helping to pull me emotionally down. So then I went on the information gathering journey of my life and the intervention journey of my life that cost so much money. Trigger point therapy, which have, do you know about that, Dr. Stats? You know I do, you? I do. I've read actually the, the trigger, there's a trigger point manual. The there's two a of chart. Them, the, yeah. yeah. So if I were to like take this down to like the way I think about it, it was people constantly touching my ouchy spot telling me, this is where, is this where it hurts? And me being like, this is the ouchy spot. Like, it was just like someone just touching all the painful spots and zinging on them. Uh, so that was one thing I tried. And I don't know, it didn't really do anything, but I spent a lot of money on it. I went to a offer, which was actually very helpful because it was an integration of um, mind-body thinking and an understanding of mind-body connection um, and a sort of monitoring of physical energy and stuff like that. And that person that I met, his name was Matthew Berrien. He, he was someone who broke through to me because he was saying to me things like, your emotional journey could be affecting the physical pain that you feel. That was the first time in my life anyone had ever said that to me. And he really is a healer. He's an energy healer. So there were times when I would like lay on his table and he would sort of scan his body with my hand, his hands or scan my body with his hand. And he would sense certain areas of my body and say, you seem to have a lot of anger or sadness or rage stored in certain parts of your body. And uh, just the acknowledgement of that would make me cry. So that was some of the first times in my life where somebody was connecting, helping me connect physical and emotional. And it was like overwhelming. It was like Pandora's box. I was like, 
open it, shut it, can't do it. Um, he and I became close because I helped him with his business. I helped him form his website up and his branding and things like that. So I really let him in and he helped get me to a certain point, which was willingness. Uh, still was going to physical therapy all the time. Still was like, you know, getting massages all the time. And this is an outpouring of cash and time and attention that I was doing all the time. I, at home, the fun, funny part was that I was buying all the tools, you know, like the Theracane and the crazy balls with the roller and yeah, all that. I, I still have it. Dr. Strax, I have the box. Of, I, had, I think I said this to Nicole. I had something that was like akin to a car buffer. It's something you turn on and it's like high intensity massage and you can put it on, you know, a part of your body that's so sore. And that would give me like microseconds of like relief. And I'd be like, ah, and then it's just like you're in pain again, right? Uh, so I had all of that stuff. And the tipping point was my husband who has, has you know, at this point, he was my boyfriend, then he was my fiance, and then he became my husband. And he was like through and through had seen this journey with me. And, you know, there I was another night after work, you know, on the ground rubbing crazy spots and just, you know, really in this vicious feedback loop. And he was like, you know, exasperated and pretty pissed off at me. And he's like, do you think this could be all in your head? And the way he said it was pure kind of exasperation with it all. And I took so much personal offense at the time because, because I knew that there was a, deep down inside, I knew there was a shred of truth to that. I was very defensive. I was very upset, I was very pissed off. I like iced him out for a couple of days, didn't speak to him. I cried and cried by myself. And then, you know, like on the second or third day, I like went to my computer and typed into almighty Google, could I be causing my own pain? Which is, it's so, it's so, you know, years 2000 to go to the internet and ask your deepest emotional mm -hmm. questions and mm -hmm. expect an answer. Mm -hmm. And I did get one. Yeah. And it was like the Amazon link to healing back pain by Dr. John Sarno. Like it literally was like, within the top 10 things that popped up after I typed that into Google. And in that, you know, moment of feeling emotionally rejected from my husband, feeling like I had tried everything and that I was just going to be a lady who went from vibrant to fibromyalgia and come find me in a wheelchair somewhere. I looked at that book and I saw that it had like something like 2000 you know, five-star reviews. And I was like, wow, okay, I'm going to read this. And, you know, I read that little preview snippet you get mm -hmm. and I started sobbing. I remember like I chose a moment where I was alone mm -hmm. so I could read the book because that's how sort of secret shamey I was about even thinking that like I personally was implicated in my own well-being. I mean, when you really think about it. And uh, so I read the preview and of course was like, hell is yeah, I have got to get this book, downloaded it on my Kindle and just voraciously read it, feeling so seen for the first time, like maybe ever in my life. The personality profiling, the traits that I shared with others, um, just the identification of it was so real to me. Um, and just for those who are listening, what were some of the traits that you saw in there that you thought applied? To? I may get these wrong because I'm probably like, it's been a long time since I read the book, but I remember there was like things like people pleasing and being a goodest, right? Yep. Those are things that I remember he talked about and, you know, his whole thing was like, he performed the same back surgeries on people and they could have the same type of x-ray, but the outcome of those surgeries would be different. Certain people would be in chronic pain, certain people would not. And what he found was that the people that had certain personality traits and goodism and doing what's right and sacrificing my own heart's desire to do what I felt was expected of me in life, really like that was the thing. And I knew it, I knew it deep in my heart. And 
not having an outlet for my deeper emotions was really real. Yeah. And, and I felt that and, and I, I felt, yeah, I felt understood just seeing those words written on a page. And do you have a sense, so I was talking with a patient about this the other day, what helps people move from a physical understanding of symptoms to a more integrated understanding of symptoms. Do you have any sense about why you were ready at that moment to hear it? So I talked to somebody earlier today, said the first time he read Dr. Sarno's book, like he looked at it, read it and threw it away. It's like, this is junk. And, and then somebody gave it back to him um, a couple of years later and he read it through that time. I'm like, oh, I get it. So do you have any sense about why in that moment you could hear that, not that you were causing your own pain, right? That seems so like, like it's your fault, yeah. um, but, that, but that our minds and our bodies and or our minds and our brains and our personalities can contribute to symptoms. I think it's two part. Why was I ready? One, because I felt that my personal relationship with my husband was in jeopardy and deteriorating because I, my focus was on pain and this negative feedback loop inside myself. And so there was like the way in which he said it to me showed me that it was upsetting to him. And as a, as a really good goodist, and as someone who wants other people to be happy, I think that I was, again, looking for solutions because I didn't want my world to get upset. So that was thing number one. But thing number two was like, you know, I had spent all those years, as I said prior, you know, um, learning about how important nutrition was to the health of your life and your body. And that's not how I was raised. My parents didn't make that connection to like, how many leafy green life-giving vegetables and fruits you put in your body is going to like help you feel this ultimate vitality. And I had already been through that journey. I was actually like a raw foodist at one point, Dr. Strax, I don't know if I, I think I might've told you that for like yeah. almost a year, then yeah. I was vegan. Um, and so I had seen all this improved life from that, that I think I kind of understood by reading the book that there was an opportunity for your thought processes and the way that you emotionally process to help your body too. I, I really truly think there was a link there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I read the book and then I had this like sort of honeymoon period afterwards where I saw a decrease in symptoms, like immediately. I was filled with hope. You know, it's like, I don't know. We've all gone through those periods of life where you just found out you were pregnant and the light in the, the lights just turn on and you're like, life is so awesome. And it's going to be great. I felt like the lights turned on when I read the book. And because of that, the symptoms decreased for a while. And I want to call back to Matthew Barry and the rolfer that I met. He said, someday, Marion, you will feel a moment of not pain. And that moment of not pain will remind you that it is available to you. And then you won't be able to turn away from that. Like you will know that you can have a life not filled with pain. And that is what happened after I read the book. I had moments of not pain that reminded me that I could live a different existence. And that level of hopefulness to this day remains and has just been sort of what's the word um validated over and over again by decisions that that i've made so um felt better you know like became very outspoken about how great this book was to the point where i'm sure my friends were like can can you pipe down about the healing back pain book it's super great understand you're loving it chill um, husband was hearing about it and also seeing like the results of it. And I think he was pretty impressed and happy for me. Um, and then I was like, oh, we got to keep this party going. Like I need, I need more help. And, and I knew, you know, then I got on, on the TMS wiki. Is that what it is? TMS got, wiki. Yeah. Yeah. I got on that incognito started adding content and getting like support props from other people. And that's literally the first time in my life I have ever um, 
put myself out there to be vulnerable, to share like hopes, dreams, and pain, and to be available to like any sort of uh, help or inspiration from others. And it was just like bringing me to tears constantly. All of this was so new for me because I was so used to figuring it out on my own, being a solver, being a coper, um, and not really opening myself up to like the help and love and kindness of others, period. Right? Yeah. And then, so then at what point, so as you're talking about it, like initially when we, when I looked back in my notes, I thought you'd come in, you weren't feeling well, and somehow we got on to this subject, but as you're describing it, and as in the back of my memory, because this is like five, six, seven years ago, you came into my office at some point and said, I think I'm ready to do this. But in, in my faint memory, in the back of my brain, like you weren't totally thrilled about it. Um, and I don't know if that's your memory. Well, too. Um, no. So I, what I was thrilled about was like, uh, going on the internet and being like, I need to find a TMS doctor near me. And then I was like, no shit, it's Dr. Strax. Like whole new dimension to you. Yeah. And so then I think I set up an appointment to come back to be like, yo, let's do this other thing together. Mm -hmm. Like let's do, let's do a door, door number three now, you know? And uh, I wasn't super thrilled to be in a class. That's what mm -hmm. it was. So I just came to you to be like, I understand that you follow this philosophy. I'm super interested in it. This feels like this could be a thing to help me through all these other struggles I've got going on. And I wasn't super thrilled at that time because that's when you really went into full probing question mode. And that felt really uncomfortable to me. So the first time I met you, I was uncomfortable because you were just the most like alert doctor I had ever worked with that actually cared about a person to the next time I came. Now we were asking serious questions of me that were going to open up Pandora's box. And I was mm -hmm. not super interested in that. I mm -hmm. wanted it, but like didn't know how. And the class format that you offered was a great tool to get to that deeper level of understanding. So I took your six week class and I felt like I was in a support group I have never been in any type of, at that time, had never been in any sort of support group in my life. And I found it so, uh, it really uh, made me feel vulnerable in a good way. I felt more humility, I think, than I had ever felt in my life. Uh, I felt really seen and understood because there was a cast of characters sitting around the table once a week, all from all different walks of life, definitely a lot of high achievers who had conditions and scenarios, some that were the same as me, some that were very different, um, some that were like pretty terribly painful for them, more so than even what I was going through. And it was just very eye-opening. And we were following the Schubert book and learning how to write about our feelings. Yeah. And so you took the class. My memory is that you did well through the class, but there was more. Oh, to yeah. it. There was more that needed to be done. And so, um, so I referred you to Nicole Sachs. And, and just so you know, there are going to be a lot of people who are listening who are quite jealous that you got to work with Nicole one on one because everybody wants to work with Nicole one on one, but you got to work with her, I think, for a, for a fairly extended period of time. And so, what did you learn in that? portion that's been helpful for you? Yeah. So um, I think as I recall, the class, a lot of good stuff happened. The writing happened. I started to get some feelings about early childhood out and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I probably was like 65, 70% physically improved at that time. And I think it was your suggestion that there was more work to do. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling really bummed about that because it was like, oh, I'm one of the special people who is still not done yet and has to go to a therapist now to do more work. And I also knew I had more story to tell. And that was a real bummer for me because I was like, God, darn it. 
this is getting pride out of me, whether I like it or not. Full honesty, which, you know, sucks. So, uh, and then it, it was cool because Nicole at the time had her book out, which was called, I'm blanking. The, the Meaning of Truth. The Meaning of Truth, yes. So I read her book. And her book was special to me because it was one, a female voice telling her story, being really uh, raw and honest, teaching this very specific style of journaling she calls journal speak and giving examples of the ways in which she let her sort of ego go and really share truth. Uh, the way that she felt on a visceral, like deeper stream of consciousness level. And when I met with her, I was like, well, all bets are off. Like anything I'm harboring is coming out because I don't think you are going to, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through a honest relationship as a, you know, counselor, therapist, and patient without it. And that's what happened. You know, she was super great, worked with me, helped exhume some seriously painful stuff from my past, um, you know, of being ill-treated, of growing up in an alcoholic home. Where did this persona come from? of mine to be a goodest, to be a perfectionist, to be, uh, you know, a person who has to straighten all the edges was from coming from chaos and trauma. And really like, that's the role I took on in order to survive. Right. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And she helped me get really honest and clear about that in a way that I just truly had no awareness. Yeah. yeah. And then, and so then over time, and we're talking at this point, we're talking, I don't know, five, six, seven years between when you first picked up the book, I think, and then ultimately came back and talked with me and went through my class and worked with Nicole. We're talking a fairly extended period of time. What happened to you physically as you kept going from level to level to level? Crazy stuff. So, um, you know, lessening of symptoms after the Sarno book, further lessening of symptoms with you, um, there was still more, the pain would come back and it would go away and come back and go away and it would change spots. And that's, you know, when I was really aware that it was TMS was when I was moving around the body. Um, but like at one point I was running and I had been having this stitch in my side, this, and I'm talking, it's not a stitch in your side because you're running too fast and you're out of breath. This was a TMS symptom. There was something going on. It was attached to my pelvis. And every time I ran, it would hurt. And because of the work I had done through Sarno, the work I had done with Nicole, when the pain came up, I just looked up and was like, what is this trying to tell me? And there was a story behind it. And the story flooded my body. I went, I ran home, crying, crying, crying. I went and I told my husband the whole story. And it was about trauma and he was just like really surprised and I let out a huge secret and then I shared it with Nicole and then I shared it with friends and family and what do you know that pain that was with me from age 20 until let's see I think that was uh four, four and a half years ago so like 21 years, I kept a secret about how I was mistreated. And I was like, I'm going to store that away. No one needs to know that. I can, I can live with it because you know what? Bad shit happens to people. Just look on the news. And what happened to me? I'm just going to put it in my little pocket and live with it and deal with it and tuck it away. That pain that I had for 22 years went away on the spot. The minute I let my deeper mind uh, put the connection together and then I shared it with other people and I outed it and then it was out in the world and it was like oh my gosh me like everybody else has had traumatic events happen to them look at that I was talking with a patient earlier today we were talking about secret she had let slip a family secret and then sort of you know made its way through the family and she's like well what do I tell like somebody in my family says why did I let that out which I tell them and I said, tell them that keeping secrets causes pain. That's what the research says. And the people who've done the research on the journal writing 
that's one of the things that they really strongly consider that the power of the journal writing is in the letting out of secrets. Absolutely. And, you know, it's up to every person what they need. Because I remember um, with Nicole, you know, and I'll let the cat out of the bag. It's a, it's a, it was a sexual assault. That is what happened to me. And she was like, do you feel you need to tell more people? But she was asking me questions after I revealed it to her and then to my husband. She was like, do you feel like you have to tell more people in order to feel better? And at that moment, I was like, hmm, no, I don't. I feel like this is enough. And at that time, it was. Over the years, you know, I've become more comfortable with owning my own experience. And now I can tell more people. And I can tell it to them in ways that helps me connect with them or for younger girls to say, this is stuff that happens in life. It's really bad and really scary, but at the same time, like uh, let my story be one that can help you understand better what to do or that when bad things happen, you can always come and share it with somebody else, right? Yeah. Um, but that was over time, you know, at the time I kept it pretty tight. Yeah. Uh, and I, and that was I'm... a wonderful thing. And that was a huge breakthrough as a human, like huge. Yeah. And I'm sorry you had that experience, and I know how terribly, unfortunately, common it can be, and and how brave you decided you were going to be, and and tell Sig and tell Nicole, and and then and then use it to help other people. It's remarkable. Absolutely. So um, more healing happened after that, and you know, just as a sidebar, I know that you know a lot of people have pain that doesn't have to have an origin like that. And what I can say is the origin of my pain was not that traumatic event, 100%. There were many other things. There were ways that I thought about myself even as a child, like I was a Buddhist, you know, way before traumatizing events happened. Um, it's just that acknowledging and owning the moment and owning the way I felt about it was another way for me to release what Sarno talks about, which is this wellspring of rage and undealt with emotion, right? That's what this whole thing is about. Um, and so that was like four or five years ago. And, you know, since then, I feel, I'm not, I don't feel like an expert at understanding mind, body, pain, pain and symptoms, but I do feel like I know what's real and I know what's not anymore. Um, and that I'm certainly not seeing medical professionals for health issues. I take no medication. I have no physical limitations whatsoever. Um, I have a very good understanding of, um, you know, what, what is sort of TMS flaring up. Um, and is there, is there ever a time I think that you reach a hundred percent like perfection or health or healing? No. No, we're human beings. Like 100% isn't the goal. Right. 100% isn't the goal. And that's really tough from people like myself to even accept. Yeah, absolutely. And right, the goals are to, to know what's going on in your body, to not let your body scare you and to yeah. think that something's wrong. And then what I frequently say to ultimately make our body our ally so that if a pain is there, for 20 years or two weeks or, or 24 hours, we can get a sense of what's our body trying to say. Yeah, and I would like to touch on that. So part of like how I live my life right now versus let's say 10 years ago or eight years ago is it's just much more mindful. It's uh, waking up in the morning and doing proactive journaling to make sense of you know, all the thoughts that I think pop around in our head all day or during the work day, or um, it's just, I, I create a moment to be able to write and let whatever comes out, come out. And as we spoke about earlier, sometimes I get stuck in like a negative feedback loop where I'm like, just let rage out or I'm raging on myself. And that's not really helpful. And um, through your guidance, I will not be doing that anymore. But um, a lot of times it's super helpful and healthy. It helps me um, get out just enough so that my pain symptoms are not really in the forefront. Um, when I do have active pain, I know what to do. I pick up a book, you know, um, I read a little bit from Schubner, I do writing and it goes away. 
over time. It doesn't always, it, sometimes it takes like a good two weeks or sometimes it happens with one session. Sometimes I just look at the thing. I'm like, oh, look at now my um, ankle is trying to pretend like that old ankle injury from when I was 21 is trying to pop back up. Well, it was gone for years, so there's no way it's going to pop back up. So I kind of just go through that sort of the gymnastics, mental gymnastics in my head. And then the next day I wake up and it's gone, you know, so I know how to call it. Yeah. Can we talk for a sec? We were talking backstage about uh, you had seen me recently for an appointment and you weren't feeling well. Can we just go over kind of how you were feeling and what the symptoms were and what helped? Um, so when I came to you, I think it was last week, I was telling you that I had had a lot of stress at work. There's a lot of politics and dynamics that felt really out of control to me. Um, and I found myself unpopular at work which is another thing that's super tough when you are hypercritical on yourself and want to be seen as good and doing good. Um, and I noticed, and I was saying that, you know, over the months of, you know, COVID, it's just been high stress anyway. Zoom, not connecting with people at work, having all these politics, I started to feel um, lethargic, that I was really tired on the weekends. I had anxiety um, like crazy and a little bit of like, ambient kind of panic feeling. Um, and also just, you know, allergies, like feeling really allergic and really kind of inflamed, I guess is, is um, how I would describe it. And when we were talking, um, you said, well, what are you doing, you know, to like, are you doing anything to help? And I said, yeah, I've been doing a lot of writing, um, but I'm stuck. Like all I'm doing is like raging about myself. And it's kind of that almost self-hating kind of, right? Why did you do it this way? Um, and I can't remember exactly what you said, but you kind of said, well, if you're writing and it's like you're coming down on yourself too hard, you shouldn't be writing. Like maybe that's not the thing to do right now because that's not helping you. And I realized like, yeah, it's not actually, like, the writing is just, kind of cementing some of the negative thinking into my psyche more so than getting rid of it or helping it. And you kind of gave me the permission to stop writing if that wasn't any tool that was helping me. And we talked about more patience and kindness and like positive thinking and positive affirmation. Um, and what's funny is, you know, and we've talked about this is that as a doctor, you have so much authority in a person's life that you giving me permission to stop writing when the writing wasn't helping me and to just remind me to think more positive thoughts about myself immediately, just the conversation made me feel so much more hopeful and so much better that the following weekend, I had no lethargy and I felt like I was filled with energy in a way that I hadn't been for months and months, like basically most of COVID. Yeah. And, you know, you've had symptoms over time, chronic fatigue-ish, fibromyalgia-ish. And so people will ask me regularly, do I think that fatigue can be a symptom of, of mind body? And, and you're saying clearly I like that it is because, yeah. um, because I've just been in and out of it. You know, fatigue is one of the ways that it's one of the most popular ways my body wants to keep me safe. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and just in terms of the writing, that's one of the things I've learned over time is that if people call me and say, gosh, I'm doing the journal writing, it's like, it's getting worse, I'm having panic attacks. I've learned that in those situations, people are beating up on themselves when they're writing. And so I have a rule that you can't, do that, that if you find yourself in the journal writing and you're talking about how bad you are at this or how bad you are in general or that you're doing it wrong, you have to redirect yourself or it's not, not you, anybody has to, to redirect themselves and, uh, and move on to something else. Right, and you know, for me, the, I think the way the writing usually works is venting and raging and letting emotions out but there's also resolution. There's also self-soothing that happens. And then there's acceptance, right? 
Like that's sort of a trajectory that has always worked for me. And when that's not happening and it stays in rage, then that I'm literally stuck. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're starting to come up on time a little bit. And so I think people probably have a few questions for you. If you're out there and you do have questions, if you're with us on Zoom, you can put them into the question and answer feed. If you're listening on Facebook, you can put them into the Facebook feed. Our friends at Curable will find them and bring them over here for us. But a couple of questions, a couple more questions for you, and then we'll, we'll take a couple of questions from, from people who are listening. So frequently people say to me, if the stress is high and is causing symptoms, do you have to get out of the situation you're in in order to feel better? What's your thought on that? No, I don't think you do. I think you, all you need to do is practice a, have some sort of regimen of self-care writing reflection um, and outlet for the feelings. It's the, it's the feelings and the emotions that are making, well, at least in my experience, making me feel very fight or flight. Like there's um, only one way and the only way is out. And I've noticed that my situation does not have to change at all. In fact, I'm still at the work environment that I call highly political, super disorganized and chaotic. But because I'm feeling better, I'm okay to be there. Uh, not that I want to you know, stay in a situation that I don't love, but it's not, it's not so clear that. Yeah. Um, thank you. And then a similar type question that I get asked fairly regularly is, do you have any words for people who maybe come from families that aren't quite perfect and have that sort of like there's, you know, we all, we all have families and we don't leave them in general, but do you have any thoughts about how to deal with, um, with having families that have, you know, real feelings and uh, real issues and that we can still bump up against when, as we're healing. Yeah, so I came from a family with like a lot of um, issues and uh, it, they still exist. Um, and, you know, I carried around a lot of shame feeling like it was my job to be better than human in order to overcome that and to say that my story was going to be different. Um, and now I kind of see it differently. I feel like <clears throat> this entire mind-body uh, philosophy and practice within my own life is just allowing me to like take the armor down and to be my squishiest, most vulnerable self um, and try to do that all day long, every day, with every person I meet in every situation. Um, which is not something I ever allowed myself to do. Before it was like, make it look and seem really good and then maybe it will be. And now it's like, who cares? Like life is super messy. And it's like everybody we meet, including myself, is very human and very imperfect. And that's the beauty of life. And it's, it doesn't, it's all gray. Literally, it's all gray. It's just constantly gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So like, I don't know if that um, helps, but that's what well, You know, I, people ask me regularly, how do they explain this concept to family members or close friends or anybody else who they think might want the information? And I oftentimes say that people are ready to hear it when they're ready to hear it. But the best thing I think we can do is share our own experience and our own story and be an example of what it looks like to, to grow in this way, to grow in our health, to grow yeah. in our knowledge about this. And then people will see that and those who are interested and curious will start asking questions. That's right. And you know, the uh, funny fun fact is that not everybody in my life knows about this aspect of healing, right? And it's not because I'm not forthcoming with it, but it's always seeking the right moment with the right person who has a symptom that really I resonate with and I share the experience. Like I was just telling you right before,
for this podcast um, that I have a colleague who, you know, got super curious. Like, what are you doing today? Oh, this is my client. I just came my neck. And, and I'm like, boop, 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 boop. I sent her a bunch of links and, you know, I was super excited about it. And that's kind of how it goes. And within my own family, my husband, I didn't even get to touch on this, but like he has seen my physical and emotional progression over the last five or six years. It has actually made him very curious about this method. He took a class, as you recall, and he still practices writing and he believes in it. And now he understands it because of his symptoms and his backache and his foot that went numb. And what do you call it? Like a drop foot? Like that yep. is yeah. Um, as a result. And so, you know, you see it through the results of other people. Yeah. Um, so before we get to people's questions, any other words of wisdom that you have picked up over time that you think would be useful for people who are struggling, just learning about this, trying to find their footing? Anything else that you found helpful or think would be helpful for people to know? Um, I will say that this takes like commitment. And uh, I will say it's like a miracle on earth to me because of just the improved quality of life. Um, and all that to say, it's, you have to be patient. And like you say, kind, kindness, it, I think you said this when you were talking to me last week, like you can't achieve uh, results unless you're willing to be kind to yourself. And for most of us who suffer from this kind of um, chronic pain and illness, it's, it's the hardest thing for us is to be kind to ourselves. Like we're just almost not hardwired. So this is really a program to rehardwire us into self-care and and treading softly with ourselves and it is a practice but once you get good at it the results are like better than anything there's literally no drug there's no other answer yeah yeah good thank you um you have time for a few questions Okay, and um, your mic is breaking up just a little bit if you could lean in just a little bit closer to your computer that would be great and so first question that came in said, um, can this work if there are physical issues in addition to what's going on in our lives? I would say absolutely is my answer. What I normally tell people is that there are, in every pain situation, there's, there's physical aspect, there's emotional aspect, there's psychological aspects. And what we've learned over time is that the psychological and emotional parts of the experience of pain are much larger than we would have imagined. And so even people who have something that's been diagnosed, you can see on x-rays or CT scans, I always suggest that people work in this direction and see how much you improve. And oftentimes you go much further than you would ever have imagined that you would. So, so absolutely, even people who have specific diagnoses can benefit from doing this kind of work. Um, next question is about holding down a job when your health is so unpredictable. Any thoughts about being in the workplace when you're not feeling well? Um, actually, I kind of learned this from your class. Um, I was trying so hard with my job. I owned my own business and I was just burning the candle at both ends. And I think at one point during your class, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get C today. I'm just going to, instead of trying to do an A plus job, I'm going to do a C job. I'm going to give less and I'm going to see how that goes. And that's very against my own nature. So I would say to people who feel that like, can I hold down a job? Just remember like, most of us, most human beings are hardwired to overgive anyway. So I do think there is an ability to give yourself a break and say that you don't have to come and show up all the time and be 125%. In fact, most people uh, will appreciate your 70% that you can give because that's all you have to give. And it's worth trying it out. And if it doesn't work, then it's not the right situation for you anyway. But I do think you can hold down a job. It doesn't take that much. Yeah, I once gave someone the assignment to do 90% one day and then 80% and just keep going down to see like how low she could get before anybody noticed. 
That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, this one says, thank you, Marianne. When journaling doesn't work uh, and it makes this person's symptoms worse, how do you release the emotions or do you redirect them? How do you get past the fear? Um, I, I have like yelled at them before. I have screamed into a pillow. I have like, I've noticed that sometimes like really gripping my hands helps. Like all, and I think you taught me that once too, Dr. Stax, didn't you? Like you were like squeeze the pillow. Um, I had this time where this foot of mine was killing me and I was moving and it was like, there was a lot of stress and I'm like limping around I'm trying to pack boxes to move into my new house and really highly stressful time that foot just felt like it was broken. And I was like, this is TMS. And so I actually kind of like, I was like, you know what? Okay. I went out in my backyard and I started jumping on the foot. And I was like, if you're broken, then I can't be doing this. And I was like, bam, bam, bam. And I jumped on it. And, you know, I like ended up walking up the stairs after that little emotional like fit and it didn't hurt anymore. So it's sometimes just kind of like, you know, oh, my hand really hurts. Well, throw a tennis ball at the wall for like 20 reps and just like show it, you know, that you're onto it can also help too. One of my colleagues describes this action of, of releasing emotions in terms of sound and movement, so non-verbally. And a number of years ago, mom, if you're watching, I apologize, but a number of years ago, my father hurt his neck. And so we all had to go down to, to Louisville, Kentucky for a, for a family event. And I'll just say his politics are a little bit different than my politics. And so we drove like five hours down there kind of quasi arguing most of the way. And we finally got there and we checked into the hotel, we put the kids to bed and I went to the bathroom and it was burning. I was like, oh my God, I'm like guys don't get urinary tract infections. I gotta go to the hospital. And so I told my wife I was going to the hospital. And she's like, what? So I told her and she's like, well, maybe there's some feelings there. Are you angry hotshot? Angry, I don't know. And so like I went back into the bathroom to get some privacy and I just like let myself be angry. And it just laughed. Like I had turned the the physical sensation into emotion. And then it's so it and it's like here's the thing, man. Getting angry like that and just being like it's just not PC. It's not allowed. There's not a lot of places, except if you're like you live in like Soho, New York, and you go to some bougie place where you get to throw plates at a wall for like, I don't know, hundreds of dollars. And even that like is such a manufactured experience. You may not get like the results you want, but that's the thing. There's nowhere for that to grow. And I also think, you know, for me, I thought I was going to go freaking crazy if I let the beast out. I mean, I will tell you that you will know you're doing it right when you think you're going to go nuts, but you need to remind yourself that if you think you're going to go nuts, then you are not because you are sane enough to know that you don't want to go nuts. People yeah. that go crazy have no idea that they're going crazy, right? Yeah. So that was always like a litmus for me. I was just like, I'm so pissed or I'm writing such crazy rage that like, is, does this mean I'm an evil person and that I should be like locked up in a padded cell? And it's like, no, part of being human, it's primal. You're fucking pissed. Like life is hard as hell. And if you keep just, taking it in being like that boss yelled at me this person cut me off you know what i'm so mad that that traumatizing event happened i cannot stand that person i don't like the way i look in this outfit you just keep doing that to yourself and you don't ever let it out it's of course it's going to mess us up right yeah. a number of my patients have have liked a book called adult children of emotionally immature parents mm -hmm. and and she talks in that book about how if, if we have parents who don't nurture us in emotional ways, then we just don't have experience with it. So the author is a therapist. She said a lot of her clients say like, well, I can't, I can't let it out. Like it's going to go on forever. And her response is no, it doesn't, but you don't know that because you've never had this experience of being able to let your emotions go and, yeah. and have that be safe. And so that's something that people learn over time that there is when we do let our emotions flow there's a there's an a, it, it builds and then it plateaus and then it comes back down it doesn't last major I, like i can attest to that that it always resolves itself and that resolution is so real and stays with you for so long and that um 
that's what we have to do as people when we go through experiences to go all the way through it. And there is always an ending to it. And I think as a person who came into this, you know, program and this idea, I thought that I might get sucked into a vortex of insanity and grief if I really started addressing the things that bummed me out and that really hurt me inside. And the truth is, is no, it gets easier. It gets easier to feel those feelings. It's like being a six-year-old kid and you're like crying your head off. You can't cry your head off for that long. There's an end to it. Yeah, yeah. This next one says, thanks, Marianne. I am wondering if your healing came apart from self-compassion. We talked about that a little bit and patience with your body. So this person says that she's a perfectionist. So she's always enraged at her body for not getting with the program and for going rogue and that it's been a barrier to be able to have patience and kindness. Um, I still suffer from that, to be quite honest. I mean, that's what I was talking with Dr. Strath about last week. Like I, um, that is a learned behavior that takes time, but, um, and self-compassion can feel really icky and weird when you have, have it, don't have a lot of practice at it, you know? It can yeah. feel like, ooh, it's like looking in the mirror and being like, it's just, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like embarrassing. But the truth is, is like, how can you even go out in the world and do the things you want to do and connect with people if you don't even think that you're of value? So I think like, honestly, we should expect that it is awkward, that it's not going to be easy for us, and that it's so valuable. And that you look at all the people out in the world slaying it and doing great things and connecting with people, I promise you that they they have peeled back the layers of their immune to it's the only way you can do it. Right. One of my patients said she started paying attention and she's like, I say thanks to myself. I wouldn't say to my enemies, much less to my friends. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I've got that little, I've got that little side of me, and I'm always like struggling with it and then have aha moments where you're like, this is we do not we do not need to talk to my friend marion like this anymore yeah 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 if, it's, if you don't have anything nice to say don't bother saying it like we all got taught that um any thoughts about overcoming resistance to journaling um start with i fucking hate journaling <laughs> that's what i do yeah. when i've like gone like two weeks or a couple of days and i'm just like oh god i don't want to do it there's not like a tasty enough cup of coffee to drink while I do this, or like there's no carrot for me. I just sit down and I'm like, oh, okay. and that's pretty much the start of something beautiful. There's a lot of then. Then it's like sometimes um, I notice that I go. I will like if I've really let it go, I go numb. Like numb emotionally, numb is something that happens to me when I've just really been stuffing too much and not releasing it. And when I go numb is when I don't want to do it. And it seems like the there's not an easy release valve for that. So I start with pure rage at the act and it does help. Nice. There, I mean, there are also, there's so many different ways to journal. And so Dr. Jamie Pennebaker and his colleagues have done a lot of the research on it and they've put out various books with different journal writing techniques and advanced journal writing techniques. And so you can write letters and scripts and write with your offhand and, um, and, and write a play. I, so there's lots of different ways to do it. It doesn't have to be just like, okay, what's the worst thing that's happened to me over the past month or, or past lifetime. And there are ways to give yourself permission to do it for like a minute and just get some things on paper. That's right. And sometimes revisiting old stories starts to not work in your favor anymore because you've kind of been there a couple of times. And so some of these other methods, like you're talking about Dr. Strax are new ways in to uncover new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you have these periods of lethargy, is there more pain that goes along with that? I do notice that things like my lower back and my hamstrings are associated with the lethargy. Like it does seem like there's um, some pain symptoms that are also hanging around at the same time, but also I can just be <clears throat> super tired, but I can check in and notice that there's no real physical reason for it besides sort of an emotional bogging down. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, what about the IBS? We didn't talk much about IBS. And like I said, you and I, that was what we talked about yeah. the first time. And so what's uh, happened with that? So it's gone. It's just gone. So just so you know, like I've had, I, I, I mean, I could not have a bowel movement as a child. I was so high strung. I was so super hyper aware of my surroundings because I lived in a home with active alcoholism. So I was so amped up and on high alert that of course I wasn't gonna have a bowel movement. There was no way. So age of six, I can tell you now, I'm like 43 years old. That is not a problem for me, just ever. Nice, mm -hmm. and food sensitivities, like any, do you still do anything with that? Mm -mm. Nope. Um, somebody wanted to know if it can work on a chronic cough, which is one of the, it's definitely one of the conditions that I see where we can use these strategies and, and have it have some effect. That's actually fairly well known, at least in the pediatric literature, that a lot of kids end up with chronic coughs, especially after they're sick with, with a cold or the flu. And hypnosis actually works quite well. One episode, one, one appointment of hypnosis with kids where they get the message that the cough was really helpful, it was really helpful in getting the sickness out of their lungs and it was really productive, but it's outlived its usefulness and huh. it's okay for it to go away. And so it's definitely when I see somebody with a chronic cough that doesn't have uh, another explanation, I'm frequently thinking about this. Um, somebody wrote in and said they like screaming in their car as a way to get rid of emotions. I think I like that's that. a good one. I like that. Uh, I finding a private spot, like. I used to go into a very deep hidey hole in my house to do this work in the very beginning because that's how kind of hard it was for me. Like I couldn't find a room far enough away, shut down enough for me to explore my feelings this way. I don't necessarily need that anymore, but that's real. Like you gotta be real private with this. Yeah. I also think with emotions, there've been a number of questions about emotions that have come in, in addition to the one I've read and you know, I sometimes say that at its very basic level, expressing emotions is about being able to recognize our emotional experience. And so we have to have the language to do that. And so Lisa Feldman Barrett, who wrote the book, How Emotions Are Made, which is one of my favorites, she says that when she first met her husband, he only, had, he only knew two emotions, calm and hungry. That was it. And, and so as we build up our language for it, then we can start to, we can start to apply it to our own experience. We can start to say like, wow, I feel really angry or I'm quite embarrassed by that, or it makes me feel kind of sad or touched. And then the really advanced is to start to share that language with other people, whether it's our partners or people at work or, or people in our circles. But, but there's a lot to be said for being able to use I feel statements. You know what, I, I heard you say that and I feel quite angry about mm -hmm. what, what you said. And I think that's, we just, we're not good at teaching that. We're not good at learning it, but there's so much benefit for recognizing our emotions, giving ourselves permission to have the emotions and then sharing them in respectful ways. It's very powerful, you know, it's very powerful. And for me saying I'm embarrassed, I'm hurt, I'm sad. These are all um, revealing feelings that are helping me to communicate how I feel so that I can get the love and the like connection that I want. I think sometimes for me, I felt like this is, like I was always hiding all those feelings. Those were inconvenient feelings to have. They stay inside and I deal with those on my own. And that's how I conditioned myself. And that's, uh, unfortunately, that is also what was bringing me pain is that I just needed to, like, I needed to bear hug the world and I need, I need it to bear hug me back because life is hard and you can't do it all alone. And yeah. I think we try, especially probably people that have these symptoms. Mm, try absolutely. To question came in said, did you ever feel like some of these pains were a conditioned response? And so they just, you had learned them over time and then they were kind of stuck there. Is that your experience at all? Yeah, because absolutely. You're like, um, you know, why do I get the pain in my pelvis every time I run, but nowhere else? 
why does you know my neck only hurt when I'm on you know when I'm at my desk talking on meetings all day long you know you do it's that happens doesn't it Dr. Strax where people basically it's situational it yep. Becomes, yep. sometimes you have pain around the same people sometimes you have it around the same work situation or an emotionally triggering moment like when you go back and you visit your family and then that old thing that on your body that hurt when you were a kid comes back right yeah, absolutely. And, and when we have conditioned responses, the, the, the treatment for conditioning is exposure. And so we have to go into those situations and we have to practice reminding ourselves that there's nothing wrong with our bodies, that we can do this, that it's okay and we're safe. And we just, we go little bit by little bit. And, you know, I, I mean, at this very lowest level, I used to do things like when I was having a conditioned response, I would force my brain to be like, look at the tree over there. Look at that over there. This is happening, you know, just anything to move my brain from yeah. the same world. Yeah. Uh, somebody wrote in and uh, thank you for swearing and said that it's incredibly <laughs> helpful for her to, um, to let some F-bombs go and work through the pain in that way. So she mm -hmm. finds that uh, very useful. Um, somebody wrote in and said, why do some people have physical problems and some people... Um, some people don't. And I'm sure you have the, I mean, I have my own like undoctorly answer to that, but I'm sure you've got a good one, right? Well, my answer is that there aren't people who don't. It, you know, the, just for chronic pain, like people who are getting treated for it, it's like a third of the adult population. It's over a hundred million people. And other people, nobody goes through life without having something. So what I say is that people who know about this, people who know about mind-body medicine are so much better off than the rest of the population that's trying to deal with this with medication, with opioids, with surgeries. And so pandemic's been a really tough time for people. And so my, my patients, my mind-body patients are, um, my mind-body patients are calling in and saying like, gosh, this is, is so hard, like you did. Can I talk this through with you? My patients who don't know about mind body medicine are calling in and are like, hey, can you refill my clonopin or Vicodin or refer me to a surgeon who can cut my leg off because it hurts right. <laughs> so much. And, and so I don't think that it's like people who do have pain, people who don't. I think people who know about this just have such a much better strategy and such healthier ways of Yeah, and, and some people that don't have like a chronic physical pain issue. You, you might also find out that they are, you know, taking medication to sleep at night or they drink or they, you know, people are self-medicating some of this, or it's not the form of physical pain, but it's emotional, it's anxiety, it's depression, it's this, that, and it just goes on and on. And that there is a huge spectrum to um, the types of dis-ease that are associated with TMS. And you kind of start to think like, there's not a lot that's not kind of tied into this to some degree. Um, so, all right, two more last questions. This one's kind of personal, so feel free not to answer, but mm -hmm. did you receive any other kinds of support like Al-Anon or anything else as you did this? So I do, I go to Al-Anon now, but in the beginning I did not, I didn't know anything about it. And you know what? It's great. It helps. Yeah. It helps because I grew up in an alcoholic home. So yes, I do that. And it's wonderful. And everybody should go that's grown up in an alcoholic home, I think. Yeah. And then last question, did you ever doubt that you could get better? And uh, this person struggles with that positivity. You know, even she understands. that's the funny thing about me. No, like I'm not a doubter. I'm like, I go whole, wholly into things. And so with this, I, and I'm a magical thinker. So no, I was ready to go. I have believed it. I've always been an early adopter and here you go. I'm here, I'm doing it. And I'm a, I'm in it. I'm in it and always was. Any suggestions for people who have doubt? Um, for people who have doubt, I think get, get logical, write it down on paper. Like what, what are your beliefs? What do you want to believe in? Like, do you want to believe that the current way you're doing things is someday going to amount to relief or, or can you open the possibility to literally people are saying out of their own mouths, the quality of their life has improved exponentially. Like, what do you have to lose? Not much. So yeah. I think pros and cons with that can maybe help. Yeah. 
I also, I'll give a shout out to my colleague, Dan Ratner, who was a guest on this podcast last summer. He opened a new podcast called Crushing Doubt about mind body medicine. He's got about 50 episodes. They're really good. I've been a guest on that one, but he talks a lot about how to approach this in ways that we can systematically reduce Absolutely. the doubt. And then somebody had written in and just asked how we find doctors in our area who use this approach. Um, we are working on training more physicians, but it really, there's um, Dr. Schubiner in uh, Detroit and Dr. Rashbaum in New York and me in Chicago and Dr. Schechter in Los Angeles. And so that's why we've been working so hard during pandemic to make our services available to people all over. And so if anybody's interested in consulting with somebody uh, who knows about this, we're available to do that. Michelle Grimm, who's a physician's assistant, who's also been a guest on this podcast, she uh, has joined us in the past month. And so she's available for consultations also. Marion, any last nuggets for people who are listening? Just believe my story. It's all true. And it, it, you can heal and get better and have a better quality of life and be super human and raw and weird and fun and it'll work out and the world will accept you. It doesn't always feel like it. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. your time and being with here, being with me here this evening. Super fun to hang out with you for an hour. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been listening. Um, each time we record an episode, I am reminded about how blessed and touched I am to be part of this community that's working in this brave and cutting edge way to heal their symptoms. Um, anyone who wants to get in touch with me, www.drstrax.com website was designed by a very impressive graphic designer, Marianne. Thank you. My and, pleasure. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, you can find the recording uh, posted by tomorrow and all our previous episodes uh, at Curable and My Hope for Healing page, www.curablehealth.com forward slash hope for healing. You can sign up for either of our newsletters as well. I will be back in four weeks on Wednesday, May 12th, 5 p.m. Central Time with another episode. Until then, everybody, please stay safe and healthy and have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Strax. You're welcome, Marianne. Thank you. Bye.